God, children under the three. Jesus Messiah, how many of you know him this morning? He so loves you so much, he stretched his arm out this wide, amen? Scars, death, but raised from the dead, amen? Jesus Messiah, sing it this morning. If you don't know it, just kind of just think about the words and just join that in. It's a very powerful song.
nice been up since before the roosters this morning. She went and sang at a sunrise service and got busy with the kids here so that they could do their thing. And she takes care of helping get the music planned and all fixed up. And I don't know who the gun that is, but I don't chew you on it, so I'm going to put that right there in case they come looking for it later. <laughs> don't be putting your gum on the pastor's pulpit. All right, all right Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28, if you would please. I want to uh, speak to you while I still have the voice to do so. You know, I ended up with laryngitis week before last. I went through a, about a week and a half of a cold that the Lord had mercy. Uh, I was beginning to wonder if there was another side to it. But uh, I, when I called, I called with the intention of throwing the lung. You know what I'm saying? Because I try to just make sure I don't get that junk in me. And because of that, I, I kind of wear my voice out. Well, it's not like I'm a quiet person to start with. And so uh, I tended to wear myself out that week. Ended up with laryngitis. There was no way I wasn't going to do the play last Sunday night. The play had to go on. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I got tickled with some of you. Some of you said, I don't know, the weakness in the voice kind of added to the whole effect of the play and everything. I was like, well, praise the Lord. Don't expect that every time, you know. But uh, I'm thankful we got through it, and I'm thankful we're here today able to talk to you. Matthew 28, I don't want to give you time to get there. Matthew 28, I'm going to look at uh, several verses here, actually a number of verses. We're just going to kind of read through this as the account that we remember about what today is. And then uh, we'll look at a few other scriptures as well. Matthew uh, 28, starting at verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now imagine, if you will... They're headed toward the tomb <clears throat> when suddenly the earth begins to rumble. All right? I don't know about you, but most people, when the earth begins to rumble, your next thought is not to make it the rest of the way to the tomb. Hello? You know, your first thought is to find a hole where you can cover yourself up and protect yourself, right? But apparently they kept heading in that direction. And obviously, from what the scripture says here, the, the cause of the earthquake was this angel. Uh, descending from heaven, and then him beginning to roll back this stone from the door, and then he didn't just roll it back. At the end of verse 2 it says, he sat upon it. Verse 3, his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Now that's the guards that had been told by the Roman rulers, you stay here, and make sure nobody comes and steals his body, because we're afraid that they'll come and steal his body so that they can then go out and tell people that he was raised from the dead. But these guards were there to protect that from taking place. Little did the Roman rulers and the guards know God had another plan. Amen? Amen. And so his countenance was, was white like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became his dead men. Verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto the women. Now the women, obviously, are still heading in that direction. And all the whole here they are. So through an earthquake, I mean, they're, not, they're better than the mailman, you know? Remember the old saying about the mail? Come rain, snow, sleep, whatever, all that stuff. The mail was supposed to keep going. Well, they were they were going to keep going no matter what, apparently. And so they they actually get there, and the angel answers the women and says, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. See, he's risen, really. They're outside the tomb. They need to get inside so that they can see with their own eyes that there's still a body there. And so the angel welcomes the men to the tomb. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Not where he's still laying, but where he was laying. Amen. Verse 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. Now skip over verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Now listen to this. But some doubt. <laughs> really? I mean, you know, 
For us today, we're here by faith. And Jesus said about us in our position we're in right now. And he said, unlike Thomas, who had seen him with his own eyes, touched him with his own hands, he said, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Now these people, there that day, have seen him alive, just like Katie just saying, alive, standing right in front of them, and yet some of them still doubt. And I would submit to you that that's still true today. Amen? We've seen what God can do in a person's life. We've seen what God wants to do in a person's life. If you've experienced the changing grace of Jesus Christ in your heart and your life, then you know the meaning of what it is to be a new creature. You know the meaning of what it, of what it is to be able to stand in front of God that you cannot see with your human eye, and yet with that spiritual eye and those spiritual sensations, you know, the world talks about all the senses, and then they say, you know, perhaps there's a sixth sense. You know, I'll tell you what the sixth sense is. The Spirit of the Lord is the candle. Hello? I mean, come on, man. The sixth sense is the Spirit of God shining in our heart, shining in our life, showing us things that otherwise we would not know. And one of the things that he shows us clearly and beyond all shadow of doubt is that Jesus is alive. These saw him face to face, and yet some of them doubted. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I don't think we have a problem with that. Verse 19. Go ye therefore. See now, what's that therefore? Therefore. Because he just said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he has the right now then to look at them, to look at us at this point, and say, because all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, I am able now to say to you and appoint you to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, even unto the end of the world. Now, I want you to do me a favor while we're kind of thinking about this. Find Isaiah 60. That may take you a, a minute or two. While you're he heading towards Isaiah 60, I'm going to head over here to Hebrews um, chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm going to read to you from here because there's an important point that we need to see that goes right along with what we just heard Jesus say. Hebrews 2 Verses 10 through 15. Here's what it says. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Now you understand that in Genesis, in creation, at creation, within creation, that was Jesus. You understand that? See, we, we know that Genesis says, and God created the heaven and the earth. All right? We know that. He said, well, then how do you say that Jesus created the heaven and the earth? Because what did Jesus say? He was not ashamed to admit. He was not ashamed to understand and admit that he and his Father were one. And that's why we know them even today as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, yet one. Three entities of their own right. Because we know where the Father is. We know where the Son is. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And we know where the Holy Spirit is. Where is the Holy Spirit? With us now. Amen? I like what I heard one little boy say to his mama said, uh, she asked him, how big is Jesus? And he said, oh, that's easy. He's two inches tall. And she said, what? He said, yes, mommy, Jesus is two inches tall. And she said, well, now, why in the world would you think he's two inches tall? And he looked at her as serious as he could be, and he said, because he lives in my heart. <laughs> you can't have anybody more two inches tall living in your heart, right? That's what the little boy thought. Now, well, we know that's not the case. We don't have a little two-inch Jesus in our heart. We've got a much larger Holy Spirit that's not only in us, but with us, around us, everywhere, all the time, helping us, leading us, guiding us, directing us. Now, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the cap 
fact of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now all that's talking about Jesus. Verse 11. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Do you realize that? Do you realize that Jesus not only calls us brothers and sisters, but he calls us something else. He calls us friends. You may have heard that wonderful song by Phillips Craig and Dean, I am a friend of God. Well, that's why. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren and in the midst of the church, and I will sing praise unto thee. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For as much then, this is verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Now listen, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of, the, of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now I'm going to read again to you now from another scripture that goes right along with this as you hang on to Isaiah 60. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 58. O death, where is thy sting? O grave. Where is thy victory? Now listen to verse 56 and it explains 55. The sting of death is sin. That's the sting of death. Anybody ever been stung by a bee? Anybody ever been stung by a wasp? Anybody ever been stung by a yellow jacket? Anybody ever been stung by one of those giant hornets about the size of a man's thumb? Those babies leave a scar. It's amazing all four of those little things, though, as far as them versus us, how that little stinger can get our attention. Amen? Amen? And you can't tell me that if you're standing there talking to somebody, and I walked up behind you without you knowing, and I had a yellow jacket under my control, and I took his little stinger rear end and I shoved it in your neck while you're talking, you can't tell me you'd stand there and go, Excuse me just a minute. I think I've been stung by a yellow jacket. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think that would be your reaction, would it? No, you'd probably do the Watusi. You know what I'm saying? You'd do the dance of ages. You'd be slapping all over the place. You'd be flailing about, and you would not even begin to remember what you were just discussing with that other person. Because all you know right now is your head is swelling with a bee stuck fever. Hello. That little bitty thing got your attention. Death has a sting. And the sting of death is sin. But look at this next part. And the strength of sin is the law. Oh boy, is that ever the truth. Here's what that means. That's you trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Boy, I tell you the truth. God knew once he watched his children in the Old Testament and under the law, God knew that as he watched them trying to fulfill, trying to obey, Trying to live by that law. He knew, boy, am I ever glad I came up with another plan. You say, boy, you mean I had another plan? Yeah. Did you not know that? Yeah, see, the way it worked was this. Before he ever even sat down and determined what the earth would be, he came up with his first and most important plan. Because God knew the moment that he agreed within himself. <clears throat> you know, that's a, that's a true term, by the way. For instance, when God swears, he can only swear by himself because, because there is none greater than him. Amen? And so as God determined within himself, I'm going to make man. He meant mankind. Woman, boy, girl. Man, boy, girl, woman, whatever. And he made them for one purpose. Anybody know what it was? Yeah, you know, and I know that's usually the first answer to worship him. But I want you to think about the, the real extended reason of why God created us. <laughs> because he wanted someone to love. He wanted someone to love. Amen. There was only God. He wanted someone to love. See, we immediately say, well, he, he created us so we could worship him. Yeah, I know Revelation talks about that, and, and it's right. That is true. That's one of the reasons we were created. But that's also the reason everything else was created. 
was for his pleasure, for his glory. But in reality, the bottom line, number one reason, that he created us, because he wanted someone to love. How can we ever think God can hate us? You say, well, Pastor Tracy, if you knew what I've been through, you'd understand why sometimes I feel like God hates me. You know, let me, let me help you understand something. I got a little five-year-old grandson. I would never, ever purposely do anything to harm him. And you can count on it. I would never, ever allow anyone to harm him. I sat my oldest son down when Solomon was born, and I looked him right in his eyes, and I said, My son, I believe you're going to be a loving, caring father. I really do. But you better understand one thing. I'm here, and I'll be watching. Now listen to me. If you are, say amen. Amen. God is watching. Amen. I'm not God. And I certainly don't want my little five-year-old boy harmed. Now what I was going to tell you is why I can say to you, well, how come you think you can say that God don't hate me? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because when I was that little five-year-old boy, I used to get beat up one side and down the other. I was in a very abusive situation. I used to watch my mama get her head stuck between the frame of the closet door and then that fellow that passed seemed to bring me into existence would take that door and slam it on her head until she would pass out. And once she passed out, he'd come after us. I know the feeling of pain. I know the feeling of someone they must hate me. Because why would they want to do that to me? So don't sit there thinking that I don't understand what it means to feel like somebody hates you. But I can promise you this. God doesn't. God doesn't hate you. Well, then, Pastor Tracy, why do some of the things take place that do in my life? Because of verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And we are not, by God and by Jesus Christ, we are not expected to any longer try to fulfill that law and that law only. You know why? Because Jesus said, I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And he did. And now we are under grace. God's love. God's mercy. And don't get me wrong. There's still judgment involved. But why would God take his only begotten son? Do you understand that Jesus was the only person hooked up to God's bloodline that God the Father was able to look down as he was a little bitty baby? Now, you know how you react to a little baby. Uh, I saw um, Billy carrying his granddaughter around earlier. I was jealous because I didn't have time to get a hold of her. I've been waiting to get my hands on her. I, I mean, I've had my hands on her, but I was at the hospital before she got out and praying four different times and stuff. I don't want to just put my hands on her. I want to get her up here and cuddle her. You know what I mean? That's just the way we want to do little babies, don't we? All right? Now listen to me. God looked down and he saw Jesus as that little baby. He watched Jesus grow up as that little boy. He watched Jesus come into his preteen years, his teen years. He watched Jesus come into his 20s. And he watched Jesus come into those early 30s. And finally, about the age of 33 and a half years old, most theologians agree that that was the time era that Jesus died. And if you've been paying attention to any of my posts on Facebook, you know that the other day I put one on there where I was pointing out very clearly that no one killed Jesus. He died of his own accord. And the proof of that is him saying, No man taketh my life from me. It is mine to lay down, and it is mine to pick back up again. And God the Father watched that take place. He watched his only son die for you. But he also watched him come out of that grave. He watched him victorious over sin and the grave and death. Verse 57 of 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you understand that. We now have the victory over what? Over death, over sin, over even the sting 
of all the above. We have the victory. Verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. See, there's that therefore again. Why are we going to be steadfast? Because thanks be to God who has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we can be steadfast. What else can we be? Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, if you don't think that there's an anointing in God, I wish you would have been here this morning and heard Sandra say what she said to me when I first got here this morning. Sandra, did I sound this way when I got here today? No. No. And I've been sucking blows of just spraying, drinking water, coffee. But God has an important message to give you today, amen? Amen. That's right. And it's so important, he's not going to just let me whisper it. I might whisper when I get out of here after a while. But right now, I want to shout it to you loud and clear, amen? And here's what I'm going to shout it to you loud and clear. Remain steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor, your labor, your labor. Ladies who have had babies, once you had that baby in your hands, you realized your labor was not in vain. Amen? Now, while you were in that labor, if you were like my wife, for instance, my wife looked at me at one point, and she said, that's it, I'm done, I want to go home. <laughs> she still got a baby in her. But she was serious. She wanted me to shut everything down, get rid of all the nurses, get rid of all the doctors, stay at her home. I'm not doing this. The ladies, you know as well as I do, once you commit, you kind of have to go through with the rest of the process. Amen? But your labor is not in vain when you hold that child in your hands. And neither is your labor in vain as a servant of Almighty God. One final scripture I want you to look at with me, and that's Isaiah 60 that I told you I wanted you to turn to. And this is where I want to kind of camp out until we get finished here in just a few minutes. I love this scripture. This was part of what I was using, uh, I think, for uh, one of my posts this week, if I remember right. It might have been yesterday. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but... You know, normally we use that word but because it prefaces an excuse that we're about to give for why we can't do or accomplish something. Well, I'd go, but. Well, I'd do that, but. Well, you know, I, I'd agree with you, but. Hello? Somebody told me one time, I heard another preacher say this. He said, uh, you know, sometimes I think folks have a goat religion. I'm like, what? Goat religion? He said, yeah, all they want to do is but. Goat religion. Well, maybe they do. Well, here, this but, it fits. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but, everybody say that with me, but, say it one more time, but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Now, if you're still listening, say amen. Amen. This is not just talking about these folks, the Gentiles that come to thy light, blah, blah, yada, yada, here in the Old Testament. Hello? Because you understand that if it made it into this book, it's not just for them. It's for all of us. Why do you think God made sure that we were able to carry these rules, these instructions, if you will? You understand these are not suggestions. Hello? Now, I'll show you how lenient God is. Paul actually taught one time, he said, all things are allowable. Then he said right after that, all other things are convenient. Now, what do we mean all things are allowable? It's a good thing all things are allowable because of all, a lot of us running 80 miles an hour down, down, down I-40. Now, if, you, if you're still listening, say amen. Amen. A lot of us running 80 miles an hour. Don't, don't be looking at me like a cow at a new gate. <laughs> huh? Some of you back here, what? He, he, like you've never gone 80 miles an hour. Give me a break. We live in North Carolina. Dear God, have mercy. This is like the epicenter of NASCAR. What do you expect? Huh? 
Hello? My preacher friend from down in uh, Beaufort, South Carolina, came up here and spent a few days with us, remember, a few years back, preached that revival for us. I took him out all over the place. And I remember him coming back in here in one of the services telling you, my Lord, now I understand why God put your tree, Pastor Tracy here with you. He said, because I could never drive in this area. But I can. You know what I'm saying? So now let me say it again. Like some of you, this is the first time you've ever heard 80 miles an hour. So the next time... You're out there running 80 miles an hour down I-40 and you're fussing at somebody because they're in your way because they're not breaking the law. Maybe we should stop and thank God that he doesn't send lightning bolts from heaven at that point. <laughs> Hello? Let's think about some of the things that might come out of our mouth and let's think about them from the cartoon figurine perspective, all right? You singer and rascal rebel rebel, hello! Except everything that you might say. And then thank God that he just doesn't strike you down. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you understand that? Listen. Arise, shine, for thy light is coming. Thy light is coming. Who is your light? In him was life, John 1. In him was life, talking about Jesus. In him was life, and the life was the light. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. But look what else. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. One of the things that I love about mornings and sunrises is you come out of that, that I'm just going to say it the way that it feels to me sometimes, that icky darkness. You know what I mean? You ever had one of those nights where just everything went wrong? The kids got a fever, the dogs, you know, running at both ends, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just problem after problem after problem. And the night seems to go forever and ever and ever and ever, you know? But thank God, finally, you start seeing that little glimpse of light. Remember one time Betty and I were down in, uh, uh, well, from here, and I didn't say up. We were up in Twin Falls, West Virginia. Where we lived then, we were down in Twin Falls. But I remember I, I told her one morning, I said, well, I'm going to go out and just enjoy the sunrise this morning. Now, if you've never been to Twin Falls, which is near Mullins, Bible, West Virginia, then you'll understand that you see the speckled sunrise before you see the full sunrise. And here's what that means. You watch the sun rise behind the trees first. And as it does, and it gets brighter, it's like little, it's, it's, it's one of the most pretty things I've ever seen in my life. It's like little speckles, little sparkle speckle, whatever you want to call it, you know, kind of come ding, 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 you know, up through there as those trees are, are allowing that light of that morning sun to start shining through them until finally that sun gets above those trees. And when the sun gets above the trees, then you can see the official sunrise. But you know what I think of when I see that? I think of this verse. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. There it comes. I see it right now. I see it sparkling. Speckles sparkling right there through the trees. I see it. Here it comes. But when it gets above those trees, it's not just a, a sparkling speckle. Now it's glory. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon who? Upon you. Upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But, if I say it with me again, but, say it one more time, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. Now I want you to say it this way with me, and here's what we're going to say. But the Lord shall arise upon me. Say that with me. But the Lord shall arise upon me. Say it one more time. But the Lord shall arise upon me. And this is what Easter morning means to us. We're going to say it yet again, even a little more differently. Today, say that with me. Today, God's light, say that. God's light has risen upon me. Today, God's light has risen upon me. And look what it says. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. What does that mean? Remember when Moses came off the mountain? He'd been up for so long that they thought he was dead. They're down there partying hardy with a golden calf by now. It's crazy. They'd seen what God could do. And yet, they start collecting all their gold and they put it in the melting pot. Next thing you know, uh, Moses' right hand man's over 
crafting them a golden calf. And they start worshiping that golden calf. Do you see how big and goofy we can be sometimes? You say, well, I, 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 I'd never do such a thing. I'd never worship a golden calf. You do it every day. All of us do. Every time we allow something to take us away from God to the point that it weakens who we are as a Christian. It weakens our testimony. It weakens people looking at us and us being able to proclaim to them, I am a Christian. I am a believer. I really, those of you that come here on a regular basis, you've heard me say this again and again and again. People should never have to come to you and say, oh, are you a Christian? They should always have to come to you and simply say, wow, you must be a Christian. Or like a friend of mine in Florida commented back to me recently, she said, I kind of get this one, she said. She said, I get, oh, you're one of those Christians. And sometimes we do, don't we? But I'd rather get, oh, you're one of those Christians than I ever would. Oh, you mean, you mean you're a Christian? You see, when God's glory has risen upon me, resting on me, shining on me and through my life, there should be no doubt. Verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light. Two ways you can draw bugs. Well, three. You can use sugar. You can use honey. Or you can use a light bulb at night. Hello? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You can have nothing sweet nearby. I mean, nothing cooking, nothing going on. Be out there in the dark and everything, you know, maybe a little bit of steam here and there, by a little mosquito buzzing by, whatever. Nothing really bothering you that bad, but all of a sudden, man, you flip a little light on, it's like, hey, fellas, look, go to that. Hey, let's go. <laughs> Draw to that light that quick. Look what it says about that light that is shining on you. And the Gentiles <coughs> shall come to thy light. You know why it says Gentiles? And it's amazing that it says it all the way back here in Isaiah. That's a prophetic statement. Because at this point in time, the Jews had no dealings with Gentiles. To the Jews, a Gentile, which meant anything other than a Jew, to the Jews, a Gentile was a dog. And yet this verse says, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light. What light? The glory of God that is shining yeah. on you. And look what else it says will come. And kings to the brightness of what does it say? Of thy rising. I'm going to tell you right now. We forget sometimes who we are. We do we forget who we are. Look at somebody and say these words. Find somebody that you look at and say these <coughs> words. He is risen. He is risen. Everybody say that somebody? Find somebody else you can say it to and say it again. He is risen. He is risen. Now look at somebody and say, He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. And you know what? He is. Amen. He is risen. Indeed. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Back where I was raised, when a country boy says to you, you another country boy, and somebody says no doubt about it, that means you can count on it, baby. You can take it to the bank, tell it. And he is risen indeed. No doubt about it. Amen. Everybody yes, close your eyes. Father, what a glorious day. We use it as a day that we remember the resurrection of your son. And the importance of what that means to us, your children. Because your word makes it very clear to us that without him having been resurrected, we would be lost and without hope. Yes, 
it was important for him to die because without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sins. And so he took care of that. Yes, a sacrifice had to be made. And he went straight into the fiery flames of hell where he took the keys of death and hell from the devil. The sacrifice was made. But Lord, most of all, I believe what we have to remember today is that without the final ingredient of that solution, that solution to this thing called sin, separation from you, the final ingredient was him rising victoriously, showing himself to multiple hundreds for almost 40 days after his resurrection and then finally being received into heaven where he was seated at your right hand and where he is even now but he won't be forever and we look forward to a day that will make Easter seem like a stormy picnic because there will come a day and we will understand in the fullest sense what those words mean. <coughs> Arise, shine, for the light is come. <coughs> every head bowed, every eye closed. What have you done with him? Is he still in the tomb? Is he still laying on him? flat of concrete, so to speak, with a scarf tossed over his head. Where is he? Where are you? Where do you see yourself when you think of Jesus? What do you think of yourself when you think of him thinking about me? I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but I'll ask you again. What do you think of yourself when you think of him thinking of you? And with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me tell you something to help you answer that little confusing question. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. You were in his thoughts. You, sitting right where you are today, he thought of you. All these years, down the road, 2,000 plus, and then some. And he was thinking of you. And I think, quite frankly, that when he made the statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He not only meant those who were present that day, but he meant us now. Because we don't always understand the things that we do. But friend, let me make sure you understand something today. If you've never understood it before. You can't do anything to make God love you less. And you can't do anything to make God love you more. God simply loves you. And he proved it. And today is the crowning of that proof. And just one more question before we have you look up. Do you need to know him? You say, well, Pastor Tracy, I've heard this so many different times. And I've been to church, you know, on a few occasions and especially around the holidays. And I know what the Bible says. And one day I do want to Maybe straighten some things out with the Lord. Well, can I submit something to you today? God doesn't want you to get saved simply to miss hell. That's just one of the benefits. God wants you to give your heart to Him and allow Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life simply because He loves you. And He wants to bless you. And he wants to prove to you 
yet again, how much he cares. Now, if you need to know him, it's a very simple process. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That next verse says that with your mouth what you are doing is you are confessing unto salvation. And it also says that with your heart you are believing unto righteousness. And the Bible says that when you do that, you become the righteousness of God, not in yourself, but you become the righteousness of God in Him. Because in Him we live and move and have our being. He loves you. Right now, right here. Now, if you need to admit with the raising of your hand, that's Tracy, I believe you're right. And I believe that those words that you said, I said them with you. And I believe what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. And I want to say with the raising of my hand right now, that I make him my Lord. Would you raise your hand? Keep it up for just a second. Nobody's looking but me. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Do me a favor. All those of you that raised your hands, make sure you speak to me before you leave the building today. Would you do that? Is that okay? I promise you I'm not going to take you to a side room somewhere, chain you to a wall, get out a bunch of spray cans and stuff like that. Okay? I promise you. I just want to make one statement to you before you leave here today. So if you raised your hand, only you and I know who you are. <coughs> you raised your hand. You make sure you speak to me before you leave here today. And look me in the eye when you do and say, remember, I raised my hand. And let me say what I need to say to you before you leave. Amen? All right, would you all stand up? Well, thank the Lord. I made it through that one. Amen? We appreciate all the visitors that we have here today. Well, we've got a ton of folks. I don't know where a lot of you came from, but I'm glad you came from there anyway. Amen? And I hope you might find your way back because uh, all of these pews look a whole lot better when folks are actually in them, you know? I come in here sometimes during the week and, and the place is empty. And uh, i got to be quite honest with you. I think I like seeing this place one of two ways. Either completely empty or pretty much the way it is right now. You know what I'm saying? Because there's sometimes when it only has a few scattered folks, I stand up here thinking, dear Lord, have mercy, what do I do now? You know? <laughs> But thank you for coming out. God bless your hearts. Make sure I get to meet you and shake your hand before you get out of the building. Pastor Brian has a few things he'd like to say to you. I guess one of these you can sit back down. I'm going to make you do count.